uh, we are in perhaps the clearest passage of Scripture having to do with the work of God in our salvation, the fact that it is entirely of Him and not of us, and that is Ephesians chapter 2. And I'd like to read Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 10, uh, what we're actually we're going to be looking at pretty much the entire um, text except for verse 10, which we're going to be looking at uh, this evening. But let me go ahead and read this for you as we begin. And let me remind you before I read it that this is not the writing of any, you know, merely the writing of any man. We know that the Lord used human authors to write these things down, but what they wrote is God's Word, exactly what it is He wants us to know, what He wants us to hear. And even though this letter was addressed to the Ephesian church so many years ago, we need to understand it's addressed to the church of all ages. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10, Paul writes this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. May the Lord bless again His Word to our understanding, and may He also apply it to our lives that we may grow in grace. Now again, this morning we're reminded that we are not saved by our works, but by the works of Christ alone. If you have trusted Him and turned from your sins, you need to understand your sins are forgiven. His righteousness has been imputed to you, and His Holy Spirit lives in your soul. The Bible says that you have a new nature, that that new nature, Peter calls it, the divine nature. It doesn't mean that you are God, but it does mean that you share His moral character. You have everything already that we've actually been looking at through this series on having a heart for God, on being the kind of person that God can use. You have that whole package already within you. But at the same time, I'm hoping that it's becoming clearer as we go through this series that even though you may have this whole package, it still matters what you do with what God has given to you. You see, we're not all going to be equally usable because we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, because we all respond differently to what it is that God has done in our lives. Regeneration, that new birth of God, which we're going to see perhaps even more clearly this morning, is something that God sovereignly does. We were dead, and He's the one who makes us alive. He's the one who changes our disposition. He opens our eyes to the beauty of holiness so that we trust in His Son and we are justified by the righteousness of His Son. But sanctification, which is what we're talking about this morning, that ability to be used by God because we are growing more into His image is something that we are involved in very intimately. It's something that requires our effort. 
the more that we try to be like our Lord Jesus Christ and actually succeed by His grace in becoming more like Him, the more the Lord is going to look at us, the more He is going to use us because the more usable we're going to be. Now, today we're going to consider something else that God is looking for as He looks throughout the earth, uh, two things that have to do with works. On the one hand, that He is looking for those who are not trusting their works for their acceptance with Him. And on the other hand, that He's looking for those who are zealous for works, you know, hence the, the title of the, the two sermons, not saved by works, but saved for works. This morning we're going to consider that the Lord is looking for those who are not trusting in their works for their acceptance with Him, but rather are trusting in Jesus Christ alone. Now what I want us to do is look at three things that I, I hope <clears throat> will be helpful. They are basically, well, two of them are laid out in our text, and one of them is going to be the applicational point. So what are the three points? First of all, that you can't save yourself by your works because it's impossible. Secondly, that you aren't the one who saved yourself. God saved you through His Son, and He did it all. And then thirdly, the applicational point, the more you understand this, the more useful you're going to be to Him, and we're going to understand, seek to understand at least why that's the case. So first of all, let's consider that you didn't save yourself by your works because that is impossible to do. That's actually what Paul is arguing in our passage this morning. He first of all asks this question, how many good works can a dead man do? Well, the answer, of course, is none. That's what dead means. And that's what you were when God first came to you. You were dead. That's what Paul tells us. Now, again, dead to mean something, of course, we have to understand what it means. It doesn't mean that you were physically dead because when the Lord came to us, our hearts actually were beating and we were moving around. If we were already physically dead, it was too late for us. We'd already either be in heaven or hell. He's not referring to our physical condition. He is referring to our spiritual condition. Our heart was beating, but it wasn't beating for God in a manner of speaking. You were dead in your trespasses and your sins. And why were you dead? Well, you were dead because of a choice a man made many years ago in a garden that God planted. Adam sinned in that garden. And when he sinned, he sinned for you. He sinned as your representative. Now, it's not the choice that you wanted him to make. It's not the choice that I wanted him to make, but it's the choice that he made. And when he made that choice, he killed you. The guilt that he received for disobeying God became your guilt because he was your representative. Now, his guilt became yours at conception when you first came into being. And when that guilt was actually given to you, it actually brought another problem with it, and that is corruption. It gave you an evil heart. You were born guilty, guilty enough to go to hell. And you were born with an evil heart, which means you had a disposition that was completely away from God. You actually hated God because of His goodness, His righteousness, and His holiness. Now, just how much good could you have done with a guilty and a corrupt heart? Well, the answer is none. You were completely unable to do that because you were dead to the things of God. Now, Paul asks, secondly, how could those who in this condition had aligned themselves with God's enemy possibly hope to please Him and earn their way into heaven by their works? Well, the answer is, of course, you can't. Because you were born guilty and corrupt, you weren't born into God's kingdom. You actually came into this world in, in Satan's kingdom. You were in the kingdom of darkness. That's the reason why you lived the way that you did, why you were going the direction 
that you were going, as Paul says here, according to the course of this world. You were living like the people of this world live. You were doing exactly the same things that they were doing. And what are they doing? Well, they're walking according to the prince of the power of the air, which means they were following Satan, living according to the lusts of their flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. When you came into this world, you were no different than anyone else in this world living as they lived for your own pleasure, seeking to gain glory and honor for yourself. Look at me. Look at how good I am. Look at how great I am. Rather than doing what it is you should have been doing, which is living for God's pleasure and seeking to gain attention to Him. Now, just how much do you think you can please God? How much can you please Him when you're in the enemy's camp and you are living like the enemy? You are doing exactly what he and his people do. Well, you can't please Him any more than Satan pleases Him, and Satan does not please Him at all. Now, Paul asks, thirdly, how much do you think you could please God when you were actually under His wrath? When you came into this world, remember that you didn't come into this world as a child of God. You came into this world as children of wrath. That means being guilty and being corrupt and doing the same things that the devil would do if you were in his shoes, you were going to share the same end that he was going to share. You see, if you're going to live like the devil, you're going to end up in the same place as the devil. The Lord does not bring the unrighteous to heaven. He condemns them to hell for their sins. And it's not because God is mean, it's because He is just. Now, how can you save yourself? How can you possibly hope to please God by your works? If you are dead to the things of God, which means you have no love for Him and for His ways, and because of that, you're living like the devil, and you're already under His wrath and on your way to hell. Well, Paul's point is, you can't. And the fact is, you didn't. It's impossible for you to save yourself by your works. You cannot do it. And so, if you are saved here this morning, then how is it that you became saved? Is it something that you did? Well, as a matter of fact, Paul says it's something that God did. And He did it all, not just a part of it, but everything. Paul tells us that it really had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with Him. God was the one who was rich in mercy. God was the one who reached out because of the great love with which He loved you and not because you were lovable. You were children of wrath, going, you know, following Satan in this world, dead to the things of the Lord. His love for you was not because of who you were, but it was because of who He is, because of His great love with which He loved you. Even when you were dead in your sins, He made you alive. You know, the Bible says that while we were still His enemies, God sent His Son into the world in your place to live for you and to die for you so that He could give His Holy Spirit to you. And the Spirit would, of course, change you from within. When Adam sinned in the garden, he lost the Spirit of God. Jesus brings the Spirit back to make you like his son to make you spiritually alive. But God in his mercy, because of his great love, when you were dead in your transgressions, made you alive. You know, Paul says that God's salvation, that package of salvation is so complete that he says that in essence, in principle, you are already seated with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, which doesn't mean, of course, you're there physically. But it means because the one that you are united to by faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, because He is seated in heaven right now and because you are in union with Him, that you are in principle already in heaven. And the fact is, if you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, one day 
you will actually be there as surely as Jesus is there now. And again, let's be reminded of why it is that God did this, why He did all of this for you. It's not because He saw something good in you. It's not because of something good that you did. The Bible says, there is none who does good, there is not even one. It wasn't even because you had faith, because Jesus tells us that you can't really exercise faith. The flesh, He says, profits nothing. The flesh refers to what it is we came into this world with, the abilities that we had, which were really the ability to hate God and not to do anything good. In that kind of strength, you could not have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ any more than a corpse could do anything useful, any more than a corpse could believe in the Lord. You see, it didn't really have to do with you. It had to do with Him. The only reason given in our text this morning as to why you were saved is that God was rich in mercy and that He has great love which He has had from all eternity. And in case you still don't get it, Paul spells it out even more clearly in what we would call the classic verses on the mercy and grace of God and that salvation is purely of Him and not of us, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Paul says you were not saved by your works. You were saved by God's grace. And grace, I hope you know by now, is the opposite of works. If we earn it by our works, then it's no longer of grace. If it's of grace, it can't be by works. Grace is something given freely. It is a free gift. And I believe that Paul is saying here that not only does he give you the package of salvation freely, but he actually even gives you the faith to receive that gift freely as well that that too is a gift of God. You know, there's some question when you look at these two verses, at what it is that is the gift of God. Is it the salvation or is it the faith? Well, it doesn't really matter because you need the faith to receive the salvation. It's all part of one package. It all comes by grace and not by works. And we can't even turn faith into a work that we do in order to receive the grace of God because then it depends on our works again. But it doesn't depend on our works. It depends on God's grace. There are no works involved, at least none on our part. They are all done by the Lord Jesus Christ so that, Paul says, no one would be able to boast. We can't pat ourselves on the back. We can't say that we're better than anyone else because we're just as bad as everyone else. We can't boast before God and say, God, I did this, I did that. No, all of that is excluded. God has done it in a way that He gets all the glory and we get none of it. So the point is, it was impossible for us to save ourselves. And as a matter of fact, Paul tells us as much. We did not save ourselves. God did it all. So as we then move to the third point, and we want to apply this, we need to ask the question, what is it that God is looking for? When He searches throughout the earth, He's looking for someone who actually believes this. He's looking for somebody who actually is trusting uh, the works of Christ, trusting what He has done to save sinners and not trusting themselves. He's looking for those who are placing their whole hope of heaven on what He has done, for somebody who knows to whom they owe that debt, that know that they are bankrupt and don't deserve heaven, and for somebody who is thankful for that mercy because they actually understand it. Now, I want to ask you this morning, are you that kind of person? 
do you believe he's done it all? Do you believe it really had nothing to do with you and has nothing to do with what you are doing really now as far as salvation, as far as justification is concerned? Now, the Bible says in order for you to be a Christian, in order to be a true believer, in order for you to be saved, you actually do have to believe that. But we also need to understand at the same time that we are tempted to sin like everyone else. And every sin that an unbeliever even is, att- is tempted to commit, we are tempted in those areas as well. And sometimes you can be tempted to think that your works somehow have something to do with this equation. Either something you have to do in order for God to save you, or something you have to keep up in order to maintain the salvation that God has already given to you. Well, let me just suggest to you that to the degree that you are tempted to think in those ways, to that degree, you are going to be weakened in your ability to serve the Lord. Now, you, you know that you're not saved by your works, but how often have you based the assurance that you are actually going to make it to heaven on your works? By the way, we do point to works as the evidence that God's grace is in us. I mean, after all, we're going to see, we've already read in our text, and we're going to see this evening, that God saved us so that we would do good works. They are the evidence that we are saved. But how often are you tempted to think that somehow your personal goodness is responsible for your acceptance with God now or in the future? Now, I think when you think like this, that's what you're doing. And I've heard this many times with people struggling with the assurance of their salvation. How can God save me? How can He let me into heaven seeing what it is that I have done in this this world? I mean, before I came to Christ, I was such a great sinner. I love the world so much. I indulged in the things of the world. I was going the very direction the world was going. I was immoral like the rest of them. I was impure. I hurt myself in so many ways, damaged my body, and I hurt other people. You know, people can do a lot of crazy, sinful, wicked things before they come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they can ask this question, how can He ever forgive me? How can He ever save me? Well, what about since you've come to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever thought this way, that I've done so little with what the Lord has given to me? He's done so much, and I've done so little in return. I haven't read His Word as I should. I haven't prayed as I should. How many Sabbaths, Christian Sabbaths, Lord's Days have gone by where I've done what I wanted to do rather than what God wanted me to do, how few worship services have I actually attended, how little have I done to support the work that the Lord has actually given me to do through, again, the gifts He's given to me and the resources He's given me. I've lived so much for myself, and I've done so little for Him. And with regard to other people, I've done so little to help them as well, so little for the souls of others. I haven't prayed for them as I should be praying. I haven't witnessed to them as I should be witnessing. I haven't even really cared how I've lived around them, you know, whether or not when they look at me, I'm actually being a good witness of Jesus Christ or a poor one. How many people do I know that have actually left this world already and I've done so little to help them get ready For heaven, how can God let me into heaven? Now, it is true that if our salvation were based upon the works that we do, we would all be damned because we could never live well enough. That is what we deserve. You know, sadly, even is what we deserve for the things we do even after we come to the Lord because everything we do is still so imperfect. Perhaps some of the things that I've mentioned... Describe some of the the struggles that you have had either in the past or in the present. Well, that is what we deserve, but that isn't what Jesus 
deserves. And if you are trusting in Jesus, you need to understand that you're not going to get into heaven based on your works. You're going to get into heaven based on His works only because He deserves it. You don't deserve it. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this, that as long as you focus on your own faults and are lamenting the fact that you fall short, and because of that, you're wondering whether you're a Christian at all, rather than simply trusting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it not only takes away the credit that God wants, the honor that He wants for you or from you for the salvation He's given to you, but it also cripples you really from being able to do what you otherwise might be able to do for God's glory. The Lord wants you to move forward in the confidence that if you are trusting His Son, that you are safe. He wants you to know that you're safe because if you don't understand that, you're not going to be able to move forward. You're not going to be able to do what He wants you to do. See, He wants the fact that it's all of His grace and that it is a free gift. First of all, to help you feel secure so that you don't feel like you're slipping into hell every moment of your life. That's what the devil wants you to think. He wants you to think that you're never going to be good enough and keep you focused on your shortcomings so that you won't think about anything else. And some of us have that problem. And we need to get our eyes off of ourselves and our righteousness and onto the Lord and be secure in the fact that He's saved. But we need to understand, too, that unless we understand that He has done that entirely by His grace, we're going to lose one of the primary motivations that God has given to us that will actually encourage us to move forward, and that is thankfulness. The Lord does want us to know what He's done so that we will be thankful, so that we will actually throw our whole lives into doing what the Lord has called us to do. So what is God looking for as He looks throughout the earth? Well, He's looking for those, for you, if you are trusting Him to the point where you can actually get down to serving Him the way that He wants you to serve Him. You're never going to be able to do this the way that He calls you to unless you can trust in His grace. It's, you know, again, grace taught me to fear as... John Newton says, but it also relieved my fear, the fear of damnation, not the fear of the Lord. We understand there's a sense in which we do need to fear Him, fear His fatherly chastisement and so forth, but it should relieve our fear of hell and stir up thankfulness enough for us to move forward. You need to do that if you are going to serve the Lord the way He calls you to. So the question this text asks you this morning is this, do you trust Him? And do you trust Him strongly enough to be able to move forward in that trust? If your faith has not been able to apprehend that, you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to work for Him as He calls you to. You're going to be spending all of your time and energies looking for an assurance that He has already given to you in His Son if you'll just simply trust what He says. Now, if you can't move forward because you're afraid that you're not saved because of your many failures, then look to the Lord and remember what He says through the Apostle Paul, something that uh, Luther was actually, I think, quite um, fond of saying, especially in the light of what the Roman church believed in his day and continues to believe today. God justifies the ungodly. Yes, it's true that I am ungodly. I, I have fallen short in every way, and I continue to fall short every single day. But God justifies those who are ungodly through the righteousness of His Son. All I have to do is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and His righteousness and not my righteousness, and the Lord is going to bring me to heaven. I need to turn, of course, from my sins as well, but God justifies the ungodly. He saves those who are far from perfect. And those are the ones that He uses to advance His kingdom so that He might glorify 
His grace. Well, if you are the Lord's, may He show you quite clearly that you are His, that you may move forward. You need that before you're going to be able to do what we're going to look at this evening. On the other hand, if you really are trusting in your works to save you and to make you right with God, and that is a condition many people are in. If you are not trusting the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, either because you don't understand that's what you need to do or understanding it, you're not willing to admit that you really are falling short. You have to crucify your pride in order to do that. May the Lord actually show you. And may He crucify your pride and show you that the very best that you're able to do really in His eyes is nothing more, as Paul said, than a big mound of manure. It means nothing to Him. It actually is worse than nothing. It's offensive to God because when you're spiritually dead outside of Christ and you are God's enemy and under His wrath, there is nothing you can do to please God. You need the righteousness that He gives as a free gift through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. So if that's your condition this morning, may the Lord drive you out of your own righteousness and show you your need of a perfect righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Well, may the Lord apply His Word to us, each of us, as we need to hear it this morning. Let's 